Hi everyone, welcome back to another Chain Abstraction Educate workshop. Today we have a really exciting talk from Ethan, who I am inviting to the stage. You might not recognise me, I've been in the background of all of your workshops so far, and today I am hosting from the Encode Club team. Hi Tabasco, how are you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing very well as well. I will sh stop sharing my screen and you can share your slide. Uh, How give me one second. Okay, here we go. Let's see if this works. Oh, let me actually do the tab again. Here we go. All right. Think. Yeah, it's that's all good. Go. Awesome. Let's get started then. Perfect. All right. Well, yeah, really glad that we had the opportunity to do this today. The past few workshops within this Educate series have been amazing. And of course, Particle, we've been very happy to sort of co-host this and, you know, be one of the main organizers of the Chain of Traction Educate series. Of course, a big part of the goal of the series was to sort of build some initial understanding and kind of, you know, basically answer the question of what is chain abstraction and who is building within it and sort of how does a chain abstraction stack look? And of course, chain abstraction has been a uh, discussed narrative on Twitter and stuff like that, especially over the past few days and really a few months, chain abstraction has continued to grow into this really hot topic in the ecosystem. And for good reason, as I'll get into a little in a little bit, but, uh, you know, going through all the, the recent workshops, we kind of started at defining like, you know, a big part of the, the justification of chain interaction, which was modularity, right? So the first workshop was with Celestia going through modular blockchains and the proliferation of the modular thesis and really understanding, you know, where are we are as an ecosystem that, you know, needs chain abstraction. Um, from there, we talked about the cake framework. So understanding the composition of the chain abstraction stack with frontier research and did a great workshop on that as well. And then in the past, we've had Avail, Polygon, and some others do some workshops going through their implementations of chain abstraction. I mean, so what I, what I want to do with my workshop today is go through a few things. First of all, I'm going to basically just give a quick overview of, of why chain abstraction is important and ultimately what type of experiences we'll create as a result. I also want to go through what we call the layered chain abstraction approach. So basically the idea that chain abstraction is inherently collaborative and kind of what are the, the layers that make up the chain of traction stack and what experiences that entail. And you'll start to see some parallels between the layers of chain of traction and the workshops that you've seen within this educate series. I'm also going to talk about our approach to chain of traction at particle network, which we call account level chain of traction through a technology called universal accounts. But as a quick intro for myself, my name is as Ethan, although I go by the alias Tabasco. I lead developer relations at particle network. I've been doing developer relations for uh, around three years now. Previously, I did an RPC provider for quite a while, and now I have been doing it at Particle Network for roughly a year. And like I said, basically what I'm going to go through today is talk about why Web3 needs chain abstraction, defining chain abstraction, as well as the layered framework, and then finally going through um, universal accounts and, and how we are approaching that at Particle Network, which can simply be defined by one account, one balance on any chain. So we'll get to that um, in a little bit. But let's talk about kind of like the problem of the ecosystem today and why Web3 needs chain abstraction, why this is an important narrative and why it's been talked about so much over the past few months. Um, before getting into that, you know, as I'm sure many of you have heard over the past workshops in this Educate series, you know, chain abstraction is always positioned as an answer to poor UX in the ecosystem. UX is bad, we need to fix UX and so on. What I want to stress out the gate here, just as the, kind of the opening, is that actually, if you look at UX from Web3, user experience and how this has evolved over time, we're actually in a great spot with UX and Web3. And people sometimes overblow the issue of, oh, UX is terrible. This can actually be great in the confines of a given application. And so this is really important because we've had great technologies that have emerged over the past few years, like account abstraction and social logins and session keys and, and things like this that have basically enabled fantastic UX, things that feel like Web2, but in the confines of a given application. So individual applications can create fantastic user experience that feels very web to like it feels very familiar for end users it's possible today to go to a given application sign up using your google account never sign a transaction never pay for gas fees deposit using apple pay or whatever on ramp you're using and interact with the application buy nfts do whatever you want you never have to download a wallet you never have to, to manage gas fees you never have to think about you know these different things and so this is like i want to stress the point that ux has evolved to a point today that is is great. And we've made a, an incredible amount of progress in this regard. And this is actually what we've been working on at Particle for a long time too. But chain abstraction isn't about individual application UX as much as it is about ecosystem level UX. So the real issue in Web3 today, especially within the Ethereum ecosystem, is that UX is terrible at the ecosystem level. 
right? We have great UX in the confines of a given application, account attraction, social logins, and so on. But when you look at the larger Web3 ecosystem, UX is really important. So this is because of fragmentation primarily. And so we can use this example of, if I'm on application A, right? Which is whatever you want, whatever application you want, OpenSea, Uniswap, whatever. And this application is hosted on chain A. And as a result, I have a balance on this application. On this chain, I have balance A, right? So application A on chain A with balance A. And then there's another application uh, on chain B that I want to use, right? So there's application B on chain B, and I want to go use that application. But actually, that application is a totally different balance. That application has balance B because it's on chain B. It's using a different balance state, different account. And so, okay, well, I have my balance on the first application, and I want to use it on the second application. So now I need to bridge. So now I need to, as a user, I need to go find a bridge. And I need to go use that bridge. Now I'm out 20 minutes and I have to go figure out how to use this. And finally, I have my my funds on the second application and I use it for what I want. And then I figure out, okay, well, there's actually a third application that I want to use here on, on chain C. And so I do the, I go through the process again. I use a bridge I, and maybe the bridge isn't available or it's slow or it's expensive, whatever it may be. And now at the end of this whole process, as a user, I, I'm cognitively managing three different balances on three different applications across three different chains. I'm importing different networks and I, I'm using different RPCs. And this is a mess. This is like a, a horrible user experience that we can never expect to be adopted on a wide scale, right? Imagine trying to get a, a, a typical um, Web2 user to go through this entire process of bridging and managing different networks and thinking about what blockchain is this application hosted on? How do I get my balances from here to here? And, and this is just a miserable experience. And so like the issue that we're facing as an ecosystem is that we have great UX in a given application, but the UX across ecosystems and across applications is not consumer ready at all. Right. And so actually one thing that I want to note as well is that of course, account abstraction, which is actually a big part of what we do at Particle, account abstraction is also making this problem a little bit worse at the moment in its current state. And so this is a whole other problem is that with smart contract wallets through the ERC-437 standard, they're also at the moment pretty difficult to apply across the ecosystem because they're smart contracts, right? So I need to deploy it across each chain. I need to manage each deployment. If I update a deployment and if I update a contract state on chain A, then now it's different from chain B and C and D and now I have to go and update all of those. And they all, of course, maintain different balances. And so this problem has been only exaggerated as we've improved UX because things like account abstraction are hard to apply across different chains because of the, the existence of, of isolated contract state. And so this is something that's important to note as well, just the fact that, you know, as we've improved in UX in the given of in the confines of a single application, the UX across the ecosystem and across applications is only getting worse and worse as you know as this fragmentation is exaggerated. So this of course leads to the question of how do you fix this fragmentation and how do you sort of unite Web3 and how do you ultimately create ecosystem level UX that is equivalent to the the quality of the application level UX. So this is chain abstraction. This is what the entire Educate series so far has been about, this idea of chain abstraction and why chain abstraction is important. And you know, chain abstraction has been especially important because of like the opening workshop to this Educate series talked about with Celestia, and we're moving towards a modular role of centric future. So we're going into a future where there's thousands of app chains and you know there's you know every application that you interact with is on a different roll up. And so this means that this fragmentation is exaggerated continuously. And as an ecosystem, we're moving further and further away from this quality ecosystem level UX that we want. And so chain abstraction is essentially the, the answer to this. It's the glue between ecosystems, between applications that solve the problems that I just talked about. So what is chain abstraction? It can simply be defined by a user experience exempt from the manual processes required to interact with multiple chains. All right, so what does this mean? I'll get into it in a second, but first, if you're interested about the, the kind of formal definition of chain abstraction and basically where that definition comes from, we have a QR code here and, and I'll link it as well. This is essentially going through, you know, like how we define chain abstraction. Chain abstraction has been defined by a lot of different organizations, but this is an article that we produce that specifically goes through our own approach to explicitly defining it through what I mentioned a moment ago, which is a user experience exempt from the manual processes required in our multiple chains. But with that said, what does this actually mean and how does this materialize? So in a chain abstracted world, a user basically goes to an application, they log in with their social login, Google, email, Twitter, or their wallet, and a mask, wallet connect, whatever. And they go to these applications across different chains and they have one balance. They have a single account. They actually are removed from the notion of distinct chains. So now users, they just interact with apps. They don't care about what chains those apps are on, right? Same way that I don't care what cloud provider, uh, I don't care what cloud provider Livestorm is using at the moment, or I don't care what cloud provider Twitter is using. I just use the apps, right? So this is the same way that chains are moving, where chains become by default invisible to end users. And this is really important because now this whole issue that I mentioned a moment ago of users having to manually bridge and 
understanding where their balances are and, and how they get across applications and you know what can I bridge, what can I bridge, how expensive is this? This is actually all completely removed from user experience. As a user, I have one balance that I use everywhere. I don't care where the chain, is, I don't care which chain the application I'm using is hosted on. I don't care like you know where my assets are. I just simply have my balance and I use the application. So this is really the experience that I'm moving towards. So log in with whatever I want, use applications with my single balance. And so this is the, the user experience that we want. It, it comes back down to that definition I meant, mentioned a moment ago, where we're removing the manual processes required to interact multiple chains. That is bridging, cognitively managing multiple balances and so on to where users simply just use apps. And this is really the thesis of chain abstraction. It's just use apps that nothing more than that, anything more is too difficult for end users. And so this is a little bit of a comparison between the current state of Web3 and ultimately the Web3 that, that we want um, for users. And so Web3 at the moment, to, to, to actually achieve your goal, which maybe it's, you know, I want to do something across this app and this app. It is incredibly complicated and requires multiple different wallets, multiple different asset balances, um, multiple different dApps across these chains. You're doing multiple transactions and then you can achieve your goal. The Web3 that we're moving towards, and this is actually going to happen quite soon with Chain Abstraction, is an ecosystem where, like I mentioned, you just simply, you have your assets, you interact with your dApps and you achieve your goal. And this is very akin to Web2. And Web2... Right. I have my identity. I have my Google account. I go to whatever app I use. I sign in. I do my, what I want. I move to the next app and so on. There's no fragmentation between my experiences here beyond just, you know, the, the underlying account that I'm using. And so with Web3, we're moving for, to a far more Web2 like experience for end users where they just use applications and the underlying blockchain is removed and it turns into far more of like a cloud provider, like in Web2, where it's just like, I, I really don't care what chain that this application is on. I just use the app. And so that's how it is for end users. The end user experience is, is transitioned to what I just mentioned. Importantly for developers, this changes significantly as well, because developers no longer, there's kind of two factors. The first is that developers don't need to choose what chain they build on based upon popularity, right? So when users are agnostified, when users are no longer, when they don't care about the, you know, the, the distinct chains that they're using, they don't care about where they have their balances. What happens all of a sudden is that now developers, they can build wherever they want because they don't have to build on a certain chain because that chain has the most users because users are applicable everywhere. So users are removed from the loyalty to certain chains or, you know, the ecosystem of certain chains where they just, users just use whatever apps that they want to, right? So now chain or now developers, they build on whatever chain works best for their application. They don't build wherever has the most users. They just build on based on what has the best tech essentially. And furthermore, these applications can actually become chain agnostic. So these applications can actually simultaneously interact with multiple chains based on technology, right? So if I want to interact with base, polygon, arbitrum, et cetera, I can do so. And my application can be hosted on an app chain or my application can be hosted on base or whatever I want. The place in which my app is hosted and the chains that I, that I interact with as an application are totally up to me as a developer. There's no longer the confines of I need my users to have balances on these chains. That's a, a foreign concept in this ecosystem. As a developer, I interact with, with any chain that I want based on the needs of my applications hosted on whatever chain that I want, whether that's an app chain or whether that's a generalized L2 or whatever, I just build wherever. This is really the, a big part of the developer facing thesis for chain abstraction, just build it wherever, right? And so this is really important because uh, the, the whole notion of, of where the end users are and where they hold balances is removed, right? So developers can build higher quality applications. They can have workflows that exist across multiple different chains. And end users, they just interact with it all the same. They have their balance, they interact with the chain, th that chain, or they interact with the application. That application can be using four or five different chains and the user will never know. But of course, they're reaping the benefits from the tech side. And so this is really important to note as well that developers benefit immensely from such an ecosystem. And so this is really like when you visualize how, like from a, a, a more technical perspective, how the ecosystem looks at the moment, this is really the best way to look at it, right? So on the left, we have the existing fragments of the ecosystem. So how Web3 looks at the moment. We have chain A, chain B, chain C, chain D. I have my account on each chain. I have my balance on each chain. The application that I'm using, maybe it only supports chain A and chain C. And then I have my balance, so I can use either my balance on chain A or my balance on chain C on this application. Then if I want to bridge between the two, then maybe there isn't a bridge available or maybe it's slow. I can't use my balance on chain B on that application, so I need to bridge over to chain A. And so this is a headache, right? This is like a lot to, to understand. The right side is the ecosystem that we're moving towards, and that's going to be available quite soon actually which is just that i have every chain that's available on one account with an aggregated balance so i have one balance that is applicable to the application this account 
is use, usable across every chain, the application I can use from any chain, from any, any source with the single balance, and that application exists across all chains simultaneously. So that application can, can exist and compose across it, every chain, right? And so this is a drastic difference between the current ecosystem, right? Moving towards this extremely segmented ecosystem where the application has to choose what chains that, that they're based on. The user has to only uh, use an application based on, you know, what chains they have their balance on. And of course, what chains the application supports. And we're moving from that towards an ecosystem where the account can have balances consolidated across every chain and the application can exist across every chain simultaneously. So this is kind of the, the transition that we're seeing. And so this is what we call a, com a combination of account level chain abstraction and application level chain abstraction. So this brings me to the layered approach chain abstraction. How does chain abstraction actually exist uh, in multiple layers and how does the, the, chain, the chain abstraction stack look? If you guys watch the cake framework workshop, which I think was two weeks ago by Frontier Research here within the Educate series, Ankit went through the cake framework and basically how the different technologies look that enable chain abstraction. So things like intents and account abstraction and you know pre-confirmations, all these things, how does this fit, in, fit into the chain abstraction stack? So now we want to answer the question of how do the different layers of chain abstraction look? So for the actual applications and, or sorry, for the actual solutions that are building toward chain abstraction, like particle network and polygon ag layer and near and these different, these different infrastructure providers, how do, how do their solutions actually layer together to create a chain abstraction experience? The first thing I want to mention that's important to note is that chain abstraction is a collaborative experience. It's not competitive, at least not completely. So this means that chain abstraction is achieved through the composition of multiple solutions working together, right? So chain, there is not one organization that will achieve chain abstraction one day and, you know, hooray, we've abstracted all chains. Chain abstraction is going to be a, a progressive build towards this type of experience that is achieved through multiple providers achieving narrow problems at different points in the stack. So achieving problems like how do we unify accounts? How do we unify the developer experience and so on? And so, uh, this is the key thing to note is that a chain abstraction is collaborative and, and the experience of chain abstraction will be achieved through multiple solutions working at different points of the stack. Um, and so, like I mentioned, of course, the cake framework is basically an answer to how do these different technologies fit in with the chain abstraction stack? So of course you have things like account abstraction and tenants, key management, um, oracles, bridges, pre-confirmations, uh, executions, stuff like that. Um, so these are the technologies that compose chain abstraction, but then this is basically on understanding the layered chain abstraction approach is understanding you know, how do the actual chain of traction solutions themselves? So the products of these technologies, how do these solutions actually fit into a stack that, that will enable a chain of traction experience? And so this is how you can understand these three layers, blockchain level chain of traction, which is things like Polygon Ag Layer, Avail Nexus, which actually those are workshops from last week, things that basically unify chains in a way that kind of create chain collectives. So things with shared properties, you can have a, you know, unified liquidity and stuff like that. So collectives of chains with things like the Ag layer and, and Avail Nexus and even Opt Optimism Superchain. Below that, you have account level chain abstraction. This is what we do at Particle Network. So basically giving users a single account, the single balance they can use everywhere. This comes down to the tagline of one account, one balance, any chain. You simply give users one balance they can use equally across every application. Then below that, you have application level chain abstraction, sometimes other, uh, otherwise referred to as orchestration. This is basically the developer facing benefits that I mentioned a moment ago, where these are, are products and solutions that are basically giving developers the ability to compose across any chain equally and create a very rich uh, user experience as a result. So basically have workflows that interact across five or six different chains in a way that is, is very straightforward and, and can use you know, various different technologies like intents and whatnot. And so these are, are developer facing solutions. So you have blockchain level chain abstraction with chain collectives, account level chain abstraction for end users and, get, and unifying their account and their balances, and then application level chain abstraction for developers to create chain agnostic uh, applications. So this is the layers of chain abstraction. So let's dive a little bit more into this and, and how, how these actually work. So with blockchain level chain abstraction, <clears throat> you basically have um, three core problems that are solved here, right? You have high risk bridging and liquidity unification. So for example, at the moment, whenever I'm bridging between two different chains that don't share properties, if I'm bridging between optimism and base, sometimes there's a risk attached to that, there's friction attached to that. And so blockchain level chain abstraction is basically collectivizing some chains and making bridging very low risk and unifying liquidity. In inconsistent cross-chain communication mechanisms, these chain collectives make cross-chain communication very straightforward and very efficient. And of course, fragmented states, so they can uh, unify liquidity and in some cases even unify balances across these different chains. 
Account level chain abstraction solves another set of problems, specifically the need to manually bridge tokens for multi-chain interactions. So when you have things like universal accounts or solutions to account level chain abstraction, you have simply one balance you can use everywhere. You don't need to manually bridge anymore. The whole idea of bridging is removed from end users. The second problem is assets spread across multiple chains and wallets. And so users will have one wallet they can use across every chain, across every application. They don't need to download multiple wallets. They don't need to think about what chains they have their assets spread across. And this is another problem that's solved. The third problem that's solved is fragmented identity across chains. Right? So users will maintain one address, one account that they can use everywhere. They no longer have three different addresses based on the chains that they use. They no longer have three different accounts. They just simply use applications with the same identity everywhere. So this can even include things like ENS or whatever you want to use, right? So users basically have you know one identity across all chains. For application level chain abstraction, the other three problems that are solved is the need to redeploy apps across multiple chains. So as a developer, I just deploy wherever I want one time and I compose across whatever chain that I want to. I don't need to deploy my app across every chain that I want to capture users from because users just simply use the application from whatever chain using their unified balance. The other thing is difficulty constructing cross-chain applications, right? So previously applications had, it was relatively complex to do things cross-chain and to have those types of operations and those you know, multi-chain workflows. And so with, with application level chain abstraction with things like Agoric and Socket and so on, creating applications that uh, exist across multiple chains and, and have workflows across different chains will be significantly easier. It'll be almost completely seamless for these developers. The third thing is a difficult execution of, of users intents across multiple chains. This ties into the last one a little bit, whereas essentially users can now, you know, execute workflows of transactions that can exist across multiple chains and it becomes very easy in this case. So this is basically like, you know, the, the consolidation of these, of these three layers, the application layer, the account layer, and the blockchain layer, these kind of three different um, types of chain abstraction. This is ultimately how you can see the end result and the, the full implementation of chain abstraction, right? The application layer to, to solve developer issues, the account layer to solve user issues, and the blockchain layer to solve kind of core interoperability issues. This is really um, how you can understand chain abstraction and the solutions within it. This is the layered approach to chain abstraction. And so as a quick overview, these are the, how you can understand kind of how different projects fit into it. If you guys are familiar with these projects at the application level, again, that developer facing chain abstraction, you have things like Agoric and Socket and Zeta Chain, Octo, Orb Labs, Cluster. Um, at the account level, which is again, the unification of user balances and the basically uh, giving users one account that they can use everywhere. You have things like Particle Network, Arcana, Zion, One Balance, Near, and then at the blockchain level, which is that core interoperability between chains, you have things like Avail, Nexus, Optimism, Superchain, and Polygon Aglayer. Behind all this, you also have some more foundational solutions that take more granular roles in the whole stack, like Everclear as a clearing layer, Seda for Oracles, Wormhole for Wormhole, Pipeline, and Axelar as like an AMB. So this is how you can understand the layers and, and kind of the projects within it. Okay, so all that said, we've kind of gone through a few different things at this point. We've gone through why chain abstraction is important and the problem that chain abstraction addresses in terms of the fragmentation of account state and the need to man manually bridge all these things across chains. We've understood that. We've understood the layers of chain abstraction, right? So how, how do solutions to chain abstraction actually layer together to create a full experience here? We went through the account layer, the application layer, and the blockchain layer, and you know how these different layers work together to create an experience, how they each solve different parts of the, of the stack, and how they, they're each addressing different problems. With all that said, I want to talk about basically what we're, building, what we're building a particle network, which is universal accounts. What are universal accounts, and how do these actually fit into the stack? Of course, I already talked about how particle network is doing account level chain abstraction. So universal accounts are our answer to the account problem and the fragmentation of accounts. And so... We have this tagline that makes it very easy to understand universal accounts, which is basically just simply one account, one balance on any chain. This is really how you, what universal accounts are. It's the ability to have one balance and a single identity across the entire ecosystem. And so I want to go back to kind of the experience of using smart accounts before beforehand. So we talked about this earlier, but smart accounts are uh, particularly difficult to use across the ecosystem at the moment because, of course, smart accounts are distinct contracts that you have to deploy across each of these chains and they maintain fragmented states. And so if I want to deploy or update these accounts, they exist in isolation on each of these chains. And of course they also manage different balances and stuff like this. And so smart accounts within the ERC-437 standard is very difficult to use across uh, chains at the moment. So universal accounts actually use account abstraction. So we, we use the benefits of ERC-437 account abstraction to create this chain abstraction experience. And so after universal accounts, this is basically how it works. I have a universal account. I deploy once, 
and this is sort of like a unified account that exists simultaneously across all chains, I have my balance and that balance is applicable across every blockchain. This is how universal accounts work. They use a smart contract wallet under, under the hood. They use account abstraction. So we have the benefits of things like gasless transactions and popless transactions and so on. But we don't have the drawbacks of account abstraction as it relates to multi-chain operation. You just simply deploy your account. You have your, your universal account. That account has unified account state across all chains. So if I update the smart account, account state is unified and it's there's no disparity across chains. And I ha importantly, I have my balance that is applicable everywhere. So there's no need to manually bridge to manage balances across multiple chains. I have my wallet. I use it everywhere. This can be MetaMask. It can, it can be wallet connecting, it can be whatever I want. I just simply I use my account. So this is what universal accounts are in contrast to this, transitioning over to this type of experience. And so I want to quickly showcase here what this kind of looks like in an actual application scenario. And so what we have here is we have a, a kind of general example here of what this will look like in an application like OpenSea. So what will universal account actually materialize as in this kind of example? So what we're doing here is we're logging in. I'm using my, my, my MetaMask here, connecting that. And so universal accounts can be applied to your existing wallet like MetaMask or a social login like Google and Twitter or really whatever you want, even like Phantom and, and other like Cosmos wallets if you want. And so here I'm connecting my MetaMask to OpenSea. So we are logging in here. And as you can see, we can display all of the usage balances here. So this is actually showcasing their balances across, for example, with USCC, they have 3000 USCC, but this 3000 USCC is actually spread across these different chains, Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, BNB, Polygon, but we're showing it as a unified balance. So this user actually, they might have, you know, USCC spread across, you know, like equally across these different chains, or they don't have dust in some of these chains, whatever. All they know is that they have 3000 USCC that they can use wherever they want. They don't care about the balance across the different chains. They just have their 3000 3, USCC and they use it accordingly. Same thing with Matic. They have Matic spread across, you know, in this case, Polygon, BNB and, and Ethereum. And all I know is they have their Matic here and they use it as they want. With this is actually a, a sample token that we use in our testnet. They have balances spread across these different chains. They see that they have them on these different chains, but they don't care about the, the number of assets that they have on these different chains. They just see that I have my UCC, I have my Matic, I use it as I want, I don't care really how much is on each chain. All I know is that I have the total that I can use for transactions here. And this is because with universal accounts, they basically automatically bridge as is needed across these chains. So if I have 10 UCC on Polygon, 10 UCC on Ethereum and 10 UCC on Base, then I have 30 UCC. And if I want to go do it for, use it for a transaction on Arbitrum, for example, then we automatically bridge accordingly across the different chains to basically fulfill the transaction. So you're actually going to see that here in a moment. And so here in this example, I want to go and buy an Azuki. So I will go down here. I'll buy this first one on the list and add it to my cart. As you can see, it's costing about 0.31 ETH. So I'll complete that purchase. And here I can basically choose what token I want to use to pay for the transaction. So do I want to use Matic? Do I want to use UCC? Basically, all I know is that it costs 0.31 ETH and I can use whatever token I want here. And of course, these tokens are spread across multiple different chains. And so while this, I'm buying this NFT on Ethereum, I'm using my tokens that are spread across these different chains in a consolidated manner to pay for this transaction. And so I think I'm going to use USCC here, or I'll use Matic. And then same thing with the gas fee. I can pay for gas however I want. I can pay for gas using USCC, using Matic. And of course, again, these are tokens spread across multiple chains. So I'm actually paying for this transaction using, in this case, Matic that's on Ethereum and on BNB. But as a user, again, I don't care. All I know is I have my Matic and I'm just using it for this transaction, right? And so the chains that that Matic is on is irrelevant to me. All I know is that I just, I'm using it to pay for this NFT and we're automatically bridging for the end user. And same thing with the gas fee here. I just want to pay for the gas fee. I don't care what chains that, that gas fee it needs to be paid on. I just want to use USCC, which is spread across these different chains. And I'm going to be using that to pay for the gas here. So then I, I go ahead and click on purchase. I complete it. And that's about it. The NFT was bought. That NFT which per was purchased using Polygon or, or was spread, using uh, Matic spread across multiple chains. And the gas fee was uh, paid using USCC across multiple chains. As a user, I don't care about any of that. I just simply said, I want to use Matic to pay for the transaction. I want to use USCC to pay for the gas. And it was done. It was that simple. In reality, that was multiple bridging transactions, multiple the different operations happened under, under the hood. But as a user, I just simply use any token across any chain with a single balance to pay for this NFT. And that's user experience. It's enabled by, by universal accounts. And so that's of course where this tagline comes from. I want to count one balance in each end. And so real quick here, just over the next few minutes before we go into questions, 
Um, I want to just quickly talk about the how universal accounts actually work for the technical details for those of you that are interested. So universal accounts are basically can be understood through three main kind of drivers or three main components. The first is something called universal liquidity. Universal liquidity, as I'll get into in a moment, is basically just the mechanism in which we allow and kind of can facilitate the automatic bridging and, and pooling of balances across multiple chains. So how do we actually enable that whole experience where I have Maddox spread across four different chains and I can use it as if it's on one chain? Universal liquidity is responsible for that. It's basically automatically bridging across multiple chains. Universal gas is the same thing. It's what we saw for the gas fee, right? It's the ability to use any token across any chain to pay for the gas fee on, on a given transaction. And so very similar to universal liquidity, it automatically bridges and, and kind of, you know, uses funds across different chains to pay for the gas of a given transaction. Third, Particle Network actually has its own Cosmos chain. We actually have our own, our own app chain that is used for the coordination and settlement of these cross-chain transactions. And so our Cosmos chain is very simply just a backend component. It's not used, users don't connect to it. Developers don't deploy on it. It's used purely for coordinating cross-chain transactions and verifying and settling these transactions as well. So let's quickly talk about universal liquidity and, and how this actually works. So how does essentially this whole component of basically having, you know, I have Matic on base, Polygon and, and BNB, how do I actually use that as if it's on one chain without needing to manually bridge? This is where universal liquidity comes in. And so it, basically the user just signs a transaction and how it all works is we can actually basically pay for the transaction beforehand. So essentially, if I want to buy that NFT, it's worth you know 0.31 ETH. I have Matic spread across three different chains that I want to use for that transaction. What we'll do is we'll use something called a liquidity provider, which you can see uh, visualized here. This liquidity provider will actually pay for the transaction. So the liquidity provider says, okay, the user wants to do a, do a transaction worth 0.31 ETH. They're going to pay for it using Matic. So we're actually just going to pay for the transaction now, right? All right so then we pay for the transaction. This liquidity provider then atomically pays itself back using the tokens on Polygon or on, on uh, the Matic tokens spread across these different chains, All right? So the, the liquidity provider says, okay, they want to use, they want to buy an NFT worth 0.31 ETH. They want to pay, uh, pay this liquidity provider back using Matic spread across three different chains. So, okay. That's what we're going to do. We're going to basically first say, let's swap that Matic to UCC because these entity providers, they have their pools in UCC and UCT. So let's swap that Matic to UCC, send that Matic back to ourselves. And we're going to pay for the transaction at the same time using this ETH. And so the liquidity provider pays for the transaction. This user instantly has the NFT purchased. And at the same time, whenever they, they send that transaction, that Matic gets basically used to pay that liquidity provider back. So you can think of it almost as like a, a small very quick loan of sorts. Right? This, this might be a better way to visualize it. Whereas the liquidity provider is just saying, I'm going to pay for your transaction and I'm going to pay myself back instantaneously um, with a very small fee attached to that. Right. And so it's almost like a sort of like a pseudo flash loan in this case. Uh, maybe that's an interesting way to look at it, which is again, liquidity, liquidity provider, they pay for the NFT, they pay for the transaction and they pay themselves back using the tokens that you want to use across these different chains. And so as a result, I can pay for whatever I want using you know, any token on, on any chain because the liquidity provider is, in, is this in, intermediary that is paying for the transaction itself and it's paying itself back. Right? And so this is how this whole mechanism works. This is not canonical bridging. This is why basically the ability to essentially, you know, use assets across any chain, it's bridging, but it happens in a way that is basically instant. It takes less than 10 seconds and it's incredibly cheap. And this, the reason why it's so cheap and it's so fast is because we use this mechanism where this liquidity provider pays for it and then pays itself back. So it isn't a typical bridging mechanism. And you might be familiar with similar models or things like across and this whole idea of using a liquidity provider, which is also sometimes referred to as a solver or a filler is actually very common. So we aren't necessarily um, pioneering this by, by any means. This is um, using many other applications. And so we're just kind of taking this and applying it to the chain of traction uh, experience. And so how does universal gas work? Universal gas actually works somewhat similarly, where we can basically pay a paymaster in whatever token that we want. And that paymaster will pay the bundler, which is basically what processes the transaction in the native token that needs to, to process the transaction. And so this omnichain paymaster, the particle network paymaster is, is very similar to the liquidity provider in the sense where we will pay it in whatever token that we want. In this case, in that example that I showed you a moment ago was USCC spread across multiple different chains. And that paymaster will take, will take that token, it'll swap that token to the token that it wants, and then just pay, pay for the transaction, uh, pay for the gas fee accordingly. So if you're familiar with account abstraction, it's relatively similar where 
you'll actually sponsor the transaction. So the payment master is paying for the gas of that transaction and then just paying its all back in the token that you wanted to, to use for that, for, that, for that gas fee. All right, so temporarily sponsoring the transaction, paying for that gas fee uh, on our own, and then paying ourselves back using the token that the user wants to use. This is how universal gas works. It's, it's very simple, very similar to, to universal liquidity. And so uh, this is where account abstraction becomes very helpful to us because we can use this uh, very typical payment master mechanism to sponsor transactions and then automatically pay itself back using that token. And so for developers, how do you actually implement universal accounts, right? We just talked about very deep or like relatively deep architectural details of how universal accounts work and how this whole experience of having one account, one balance in any chain is achieved. So for application developers, how do I create an application that, that can actually use it? How do users actually access a universal account in my application? Well, it's very simple. It basically takes less than 10 lines of code, or once we release it on mainnet, it will, it'll take less than 10 lines of code. You can basically have, you know, your user connect through any standard connection mechanism, whether that's rainbow kit or web3 modal or even particle connect which is another product that we have then you can use a uh, wallet connection through eip 1193 and so then basically just plug in your universal account on top of this so your wallet connection goes through this 1193 provider your, your universal account is an object that plugs directly into that so it's sort of like a wrapper for your underlying wallet connection and then it plugs directly into ethers or web3js or vm or whatever and then you do transactions and so it's basically five lines of code that you use to plug in directly to your wallet connection provider and then into Ethers or Web3.js or, or VM and so on. And so it's a five minute integration for developers. So you can give users the ability to have basically a single balance they can access from anywhere. One balance, one account on any chain and less than, than 10 lines of code. And so this is basically how it works and how developers can integrate it. There's simply an 1193 provider object you can plug directly into Ethers or Web3 uh, or VM and do any transaction accordingly. And so it's super, super simple. You don't need to make any structural changes to your application. You just plug this directly in through our SDK and it works as easily as that. And so this is just a, another quick, like final slide here to, to understand how this whole process works on the back end. I won't go through this in too much detail because I do want to leave some time for questions, but essentially the way this works in the background is that as I kind of went through the user sends a transaction, they want to use funds on Polygon and on base. And so what we can do here is we will essentially send that transaction or I guess they want to buy an NFT on base using Floats on Polygon. And so they basically, that, that Matic that they want to use on Polygon goes to USDC, which is the intermediary token of the liquidity provider or the filler. Then this goes to the particle chain. The particle chain is responsible for basically coordinating and validating and settling this transaction. We have something called a bundler, which will then execute the operation on Polygon to actually get that USDT. And then we will settle that on the particle chain then we can basically take that USCC, give it to the liquidity provider. That liquidity, that liquidity provider pays for the transaction on base, which is used in ETH and, and use, pays for the, the NFT. And so a little bit complicated here, but this is basically how it works in, in a nutshell. And so you can, you can refer back to this screenshot if you're interested in kind of the actual underlying flow here. So this is uh, kind of how everything works here. Of course, a protocol network, like I mentioned, everything that I just talked about is account level chain abstraction. It works very well with application level chain abstraction with things like Agoric and Socket and so on at the developer level. And it also works very well with blockchain level chain abstraction. So things like Avail Nexus and Polygon Aglair for the like fundamental interoperability. And so this is basically the full rundown that I had here. And we talked a lot, I talked a lot about a different, a few different topics here. We started with the problem, right? Why is chain abstraction important? How does chain, chain abstraction materialize? We talked about the definition of chain abstraction. What is the formal way of understanding what chain abstraction actually is? Then we talked about the layers of chain abstraction, right? So how does the chain abstraction stack compose? What are the different projects building within it? How do they fit together? Then finally, we ended off with a full run of universal accounts. So what does the user experience look like here? How does this differ from the current UX? And of course, how does this work under the hood? So yeah, that's basically the presentation I had. I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, hopefully it was helpful. Thank you. That was actually a really helpful session. We've got a couple of comments in the chat um, from people saying they're going to be re-watching it um, to make sure they've understood everything. So much to learn. Um, so we have got a few questions in the chat. Um, I can, if I press start live answer, are you seeing the question come up on your screen? I am. Yeah, let's see. Just want to about how to impression between blockchain account and application level, how are hard task solutions between layers? Yeah, that's a great question. Basically, when you look at like the three different layers and so it's chain abstraction is essentially this umbrella term. Chain abstraction refers to this overall experience, this user, this user experience that is exempt from the processes of manually interacting with different chains. And so blockchain account and application level are the components that 
uh, make up that experience, right? And so with blockchain level, this is very simply just the part of chain abstraction that enables blockchains to be intrinsically interoperable, right? So this is things like Polygon Aguilar. It's the ability to aggregate and have multiple blockchains that operate seamlessly with one another, have unified liquidity that have very seamless cross-chain messaging, stuff like this, right? And so that is one part of chain abstraction. Account level chain abstraction, which is another component of chain abstraction, is what we do at Particle. This is just very simply, it's very narrowly just addressing the account. It's the ability to give users one balance they can use everywhere. Right? And so this is just, that's all account level chain abstraction does. It's giving users a unified account across all chains. Then the third one is application level chain abstraction, right? So this is the third core component of chain abstraction, which is just simply giving developers the ability to compose across any chain. All right, so collectively have this core blockchain interoperability through blockchain level chain abstraction. You have users with the ability to use funds across any chain with account level chain abstraction. You have developers with the ability to build applications across any chain with application level chain abstraction. And so these three core components are what create and uh, enable this chain abstraction experience. And so that, that's how these things all fit, uh, fit together. And that's how these kind of tasks or solutions differentiate. There are three very distinctly different problems that are being solved. And so as a result, different organizations tackle different problems and they work as a layer as three different types of solutions that kind of work with one another to create this experience. And so this is how they kind of all fit under this chain abstraction umbrella. Nice, thank you. Our next question is about paying fees and how that works in chain extraction. You did sort of touch on this. This was asked about 20 minutes ago. So you might have, Giorgio might have had their question answered after the fact, but if you just want to go over it again, maybe. Yeah, about cover for deployment for use of multiple chains, but the fees would be called from and fees would be paid for it, which deploy on Polygon, but the user wants to use a different chain or the TX on the smart contract would be on Polygon. Yeah, so the actual transactions, for example, if I'm doing a transaction um, on Polygon, right? And the user wants to pay gas fees from a different chain or user balance from a different chain for that matter. All the transactions are still happening on Polygon. And this is because of the mechanisms that we're doing here to basically pay for the transaction for the user. So if I'm buying an NFT on Polygon and I want to pay for the gas of that transaction using, you know, UCC from base, for example, then that transaction is actually still being paid in Matic on Polygon. But what's happening is that we're basically having an entity, in this case, a paymaster that is giving the funds to pay for that transaction, right? So we're still paying that transaction at its base is still being paid for Matic on Polygon, but that's being paid by the paymaster. The paymaster is holding funds for that. The user might not have Matic on Polygon. And so that's why we're paying for it for them. And the user is just paying the paymaster. So the paymaster is sort of like an entity that has this agreement, right? The paymaster is saying, I am willing to pay for this gas fee for the user, because I have, as a paymaster, I have funds on Polygon that I can use to pay for this transaction. And the agreement here is that the user will pay me back in the token that I'm okay with receiving. In this case, UCC on base. So the user, the agreement is the user pays me with UCC on base. I pay for the transaction on Polygon and everything on Polygon that with your application, the transaction is still being paid with Matic on Polygon or whatever token that you want to use. The gas is still being paid with Matic on Polygon. And the only difference here is that where those funds are coming from is not from the user's balance, but it's from the paymaster or the liquidity provider. And the user is just paying those entities back using the funds they have on other chains. So it's sort of like this intermediary that is just simply fronting those funds. And then as a result, the user can use any, any asset. Giorgio says, got it. Thanks for clarifying. Another question is about support on non EVM chains. How would a smart contract account work on those chains? Yeah, that's a good, this is actually a, a good question. We've had a lot about this as well. Once we launch by default with universal accounts, they will only be on EVM chains because applying this model to non-EVM chains is a lot more complicated. And so we need a little bit more time to like, you know, completely uh, flesh this out. But if you're familiar with sort of the near model, we are pretty big fans of this and we'll probably want something similar where essentially the smart contract account or the underlying universal account will have the ability to basically sign transactions with equivalent accounts and other chains. We've actually implemented similar things to, to this within the Bitcoin ecosystem. We've had some products in the past that do things similar, where basically we can have an account that can sign transactions for other accounts on different non-EVM chains. And so here we could basically have like this core smart contract account that can exist on EVM chains, but it can own or be directly compatible or tied to accounts on Solana or Cosmos chains, stuff like that. And as a result, it can sign transactions for those chains. We'd use a very similar mechanism to, to the liquidity provider and paymaster kind of like architecture that we use right now. It just would be applied, you know, across these different VMs. 
there would be some different technical nuances of how we achieve it and how we reduce risk and stuff like this, because there would be additional risk. Anytime that you're moving across VMs, there's just more involved, but we probably use the like correct term for a signature aggregation, which is basically the, the ability to sign transactions for equivalent accounts and other chains through the means of like a master account that you have on the on EVM chain. So Near does this with Near accounts. And actually, I think there's a workshop on Wednesday where Near is going to go through this exact topic. So I'd recommend watching that. Near does this with Near accounts on the Near blockchain. They can sign transactions for external accounts using NPC nodes. And so we're going to do probably something similar where we're going to be able to sign transactions for accounts on external chains using a universal account on EVM chains. And that's our current architecture. We'll see how that materializes. But to start for the, the first few months of release, it will only be of EVM. Then we're going to start to slowly expand to probably Solana first and then some Cosmos chains and so on. Nice. And then let me check the chat. There's one more question in the question box, which is quite a long one. Actually, instead of putting it on the screen, if you go to the questions tab, um, you might be able to see it better. Well, account abstraction mechanism is based entirely on smart contract. So the priestess after ERC for the standard differences in nutshell will be the introduction of new smart contracts. Sort of, yeah. So right now we're very focused on building for ERC 437. We're aware that, you know, there are, are other standards that are kind of, you know, coming out and we'll probably end up being better than ERC 437. So we're willing to kind of figure out how we can migrate to those in the future as is needed. But to start, we're going to be focused on ERC-437, which is exclusively smart contract based. It's based on smart contract accounts, which they have their drawbacks and they have their benefits. For us, we the reason why we we use account abstraction in the first place is because we benefit a lot from the paymaster mechanism through basically sponsoring gas fees. Through pop-up list transactions, this helps a lot as well. We can basically we can have signatures. You can do one signature on a single chain, and that can basically sign transactions for a um, multitude of other chains, which is another big point that we use account abstraction for. And so account abstraction makes this whole process with universal accounts 10 times better than EOAs. And so that's why we use ERC-437. But if new standards emerge in the future that will be better, um, like after ERC-437 starts to be phased out, then we'll transition to those and we'll figure out a way to do so in a way that hopefully is, doesn't have a lot of friction attached to it. But we'll kind of cross that bridge once we get there. For now, we're quite focused on ERC-437, but are 100% are willing to move to better standards as they're introduced. Because for us, like, we aren't, we, we, are, we don't care about ERC-437 as like a standard. We care about what it enables for the end users. And so if there's a way to do that same thing in a more user-friendly environment that is, is more universally compatible, then we'll do that for sure. Um, but, but for now, we are uh, basing it entirely on smart contract wallets. Um, the liquidity provider basically maintains, for that second question, um, the liquidity provider maintains pools across different chains. And so, for example, this liquidity provider will maintain pools of an intermediary token. And so the, the, the liquidity provider doesn't say, I need Matic and Base and Polygon uh, and, and sorry, and, and ETH and, and ARB and all, you know, all these different tokens. They maintain one token across all these different chains that we want to interact with. So they have one pool. I think we're probably going to use UCT, right? And so they, they have a pool of UCT, UCT that they can use across all these different chains. And they swap between that UCT and the token that they want to use as is needed. And so if, if I want to pay for a transaction using ETH, then that liquidity provider says, okay, I have a pool of UCT on Ethereum. That, but you want to pay for the transaction in ETH, so we're going to swap that UCT to ETH to pay for the transaction. And so it's sort of like this like pool of value that is used to pay for these transactions, just to swap for the tokens that is needed to pay for the transaction. And so same thing with the Paymaster. They have an intermediary token. The Paymaster is a little bit different because you can sponsor uh, gas fees using, you know, the, the core token to pay for that transaction fee. So, but in, in reality, it functions quite similarly where you have a pool of tokens the payment master pays for the transaction using it swaps using whatever token that is needed to pay for that transaction and then pays itself back. And so this is basically how it works now. It maintains these, these this liquidity and these pools across the different chains. Right now, these pools are maintained by Particle, and eventually this will become more decentralized and open, where we can maintain pools across any different chain. They can be done permissionlessly and, and be very straightforward. Um, but for now, these are basically entities that are ran by Particle and and are on the path for decentralization and anybody can run them and of course earn fees from doing so. So that's a little bit more about how liquidity providers work. Nice, thank you very much. I think that's all the questions we have in chat. Um, so as you mentioned, our workshop on Wednesday is on apps that work on all chains. So if you found this workshop interesting, definitely come to that one as well. For all of those asking about rewatching this presentation, it will be uploaded on YouTube soon. So don't worry, you can go back and rewatch any of the bits that you want to. There's a few people typing, but otherwise I'm sure they're just gonna say thank you to you, Tabasco, because this has been a really interesting um, and informative 
Um, a good speedy manner uh, is what Giorgio has said. Nina says, thank you. So I think that is all the questions we have and nobody else is typing. So we will end the session there and we'll see you all on Wednesday for our next workshop. Thank you everyone for coming and joining us again today. Can't wait to see you again on Wednesday. Bye everyone. Thanks guys.